I'm Juita Gupta, and this is The Pulse. The Accessible Canada Act is a landmark piece of legislation which aims to realize a barrier-free Canada by 2040. A key principle of the Act is nothing about us without us. This means that people with disabilities should be fully consulted when developing laws, policies, and principles that impact us. It's clearly an ambitious piece of legislation. However, as with most laws, a lot comes down to implementation and the people tasked with writing regulations, creating standards, and offering advice. The Accessible Canada Act can potentially have far-reaching consequences for people with disabilities impacting our lives in ways both big and small. Today, we meet Canada's Chief Accessibility Officer. It's time to put your finger on the pulse. Hello and welcome to The Pulse on AMI-audio. I'm Joitha Gupta, joining you from the Accessible Media Studios in Toronto. I'm wearing a light blue long sleeve shirt, which is buttoned down in the front, and you can probably see the buttons there. And my hair is pulled back in a bun. I am also, uh, I also have my headphones on, so these black headphones that go over the years. So that's just a brief description of what I look like. In recognition of National Accessibility Awareness Week, which is celebrated towards the end of May, we wanted to check in with Stephanie Cadieu, who is Canada's Chief Accessibility Officer. This is her first time being on the program, and she's been on the job for about a year. Stephanie, hello and welcome to the program. I'm so glad you could join us today. Well, thank you very much. It's nice to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Stephanie, what do you do in your role as our as Canada's Chief Accessibility Officer? Well, it's a new role. It was, uh, it's a role legislated under the Act. And my job is as an independent advisor to the minister responsible. And what that means and what, the, what ultimately uh, I will do is present a report to her on an annual basis to uh, document the progress that we're making towards the goals of the Act, which, of course, ultimately is a barrier-free Canada by 2040. So... Um, in that role, in order to do that, in order to do that reporting, um, I'm taking a sort of 40,000 foot look level at, at the work that's going on inside the federal government, inside the federally regulated sectors like banking, like tech, uh, telecoms and airlines, um, and beyond in the private sector, uh, in, the pro- in the provincial realm, um, and internationally to see what trends are emerging uh, that might have impact positively or negatively on our progress. Um, so it's a it's a wide ranging role. Um, I'm there to bring cohesion to all of the work that's going on under the Act, um, and ultimately to keep us moving forward. Mm-hmm. Well, as you say, it is a it is a wide ranging role. Do you have a game plan for how you intend to go about balancing these different priorities? Because you don't want to be focused so much on the provincial scene uh, that you neglect the federal, or you don't want to be so focused on the pre- federal that you neglect uh, what's happening internationally. So how do you intend to balance all of those requirements on your time? Well, that's it. That's an ongoing challenge. Um, <laughs> but I would say in the first year, what I've spent most of my time in the first year just reaching out, just having those conversations and developing the relationships um, back and forth with international partners, with partners provincially, with partners uh, inside the federal government and, and, and inside this, this, the regulated sectors, just having conversations uh, with the disability community broadly uh, across the country with advocates to, because we need to hear from both sides of this equation, right? Those, those who are implementing, those who are who are trying to do the work um, and those who are ultimately affected by the work and whether, so we can know whether or not we're seeing progress and whether or not it's working and frankly, making connections between the two because uh, the work can't go on without the involvement of people with disabilities as the as is embedded in the act. Um, but making those connections is not always easy or straightforward um, for for the companies uh, or or the departments that are trying to trying to put their accessibility plans together. So a lot of it's about connecting. Once those connections are in place and that network is strong enough, 
then then a lot of it balances out because the information will come to me. Uh, and so I expect that a lot of my time will continue to be spent uh, in that outward facing role, listening, uh, listening, sharing. Um, and and I think we're, we're deciding uh, as we go that there are a lot of priorities under the act um, from employment, the built environment, communications, technology, all the way through the seven different uh, areas. We can't possibly do a deep dive on all of them all of the time. Um, but employment is certainly, uh, it's always been a focus of mine in my, in my uh, career. And it's certainly something that people with disabilities raised as one of the most important things that government could do for them is to help them get employed. So I am definitely taking, uh, making a point of, of digging in a little bit on employment over the first uh, year or two. How are you planning to dig in on employment? Well, it's really about looking at what the be best practices are um, and what's working and what's not working. So the federal government made a commitment to hire 5,000 people into the public service by 2025. Um, and despite a lot of really good efforts and a lot of pilot programs, um, a lot of changes to policy, we're still not seeing the result that we should. Um, and that's you know something that the public service is very much focused on. But I'm trying to look at it from a different perspective uh, than those who are doing the implementation and say, well, what are we seeing? What are the trends? Why? Why maybe? It, you know, what are the things that we're not, what that's not working? Um, and look outside. What are what are private sector organizations doing that could be looked at as a best practice? Is anyone having success uh, in this in this arena? Um, so it's a lot. Again, it's delving. It's asking questions. I don't think anyone has this figured out yet, uh, in, entirely. Uh, but we want to be able to to hone in and, and help to guide uh, government and the agencies in their work in this area. You know, um, not too recent, not too long ago, I read that about um, seven out of 10 Canadians who are blind or low vision are either unemployed and underemployed. And when I was in university uh, some 10, 15 years ago, I'm not quite going to tell you when, but uh, <laughs> uh, those numbers were pretty much the same. Why is it that although everybody acknowledges that employment barriers continue to be a major issue within the disability community, there isn't one person mm -hmm. who has said, oh, this isn't a big deal. Why is it, based on your discussions and the conversations that you've had, that we have made so little progress? You know what, this is exactly why um, I'm trying to dig in here. Because that's, you're right, we have, yeah, and I'm not sure of the exact statistics overall, um, but we know, right? We know um, all of the statistics tell us that people with disabilities broadly are underemployed or unemployed. Um, and we know that about 645,000 people right now in Canada who have disabilities want to work, um, they're ready to work. We know that most of those people, or not most, but at least half of those people, sorry, um, have a, a level of post-secondary education or trade. So these folks are highly employable, and yet we're not seeing the movement of numbers uh, into employment that we would hope. And organizations are putting out their, their flag and saying, we want to hire, and we're open to people with disabilities, but we're not seeing it, it result in hires. I think there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, I think some of them are as simple as even if somebody is offered a job, if the accessible transportation doesn't exist to get them to the job, they can't accept. Um, if they if accessible housing doesn't exist, they can't move to that location they're being asked to, to transfer to or move to. Um, if, uh, if the application process involves artificial intelligence, it may screen dis people with disabilities out before they ever get into the process. So we know there are all sorts of complexities to this, but we also know there are examples of good practice. Um, when I was in Geneva in February, I was I was blown away by an example um, of a an, an owner of a number of McDonald's franchises who had just made a decision that he wanted to. Uh, his wanted his workforce to 
be representative of his community and that so that it should include people with disabilities. And he sent a quote to hire some. And the first folks in the door uh, were folks who were deaf or um, on the autism spectrum. And what did he do? He didn't say, oh, this is not going to work. This is a, you know, retail, you have to be able to communicate with customers. He didn't say that at all. He just said, okay, what do we need to do to make this work? And in, in you know, I'm, I'm abbreviating, obviously, but in short, he, he offered sign language training to all of his staff so that they could communicate with their new colleague. Um, he, the, they changed some processes in the kitchen uh, because some of the some of the processes were hard to follow for some of the folks that were neurodiverse. They they responded better to a sort of a color coding system. They just put it in place. They didn't they didn't see it as a burden. They didn't see it as difficult. It was something that needed to happen, so they did it. Um, and and we asked the question, well, how did you do it? They said, well, you just start. And so that approach and that attitude. Um, was was clearly um, the the reason why they were having success. They had the attitude that it would work from the beginning. Now, and they said they also said not everybody is suited to to the employment, and sometimes it doesn't work out. But that's the same for people with and without disabilities, right? That isn't that isn't unique to people with disabilities. So uh, their their attitude was really different. And it set a tone and a culture in an organization that allowed for that hiring. And it allowed for those people to be successful on the job. And I think those kind of examples are the ones we need to to really hold up um, for others to to see and to, to, to try and get their head wrapped around what's it going to take. Um, and to really be open to trying things that are different. Um, to not being stuck in the systems and processes that they've used for everyone else and assume that people with disabilities can fit in to those processes. Those processes may very well be the reason people are being excluded. Mm -hmm. Years ago, I took a management class and there was a poster on the wall which was captioned, culture can eat strategy for lunch. As your, as in your role as the chief accessibility officer, when you think about uh, creating a culture of accessibility or a culture of inclusion, how important is that compared to having a strategy or having a plan or having a policy? And if you think that culture is important, how do you go about introducing that culture or bringing about that change? Yeah, well, isn't that the million dollar question? Um, you're really hitting on it. All of the policies are essential. All of the practices are essential. The accessibility in the built environment is essential. But we can have the best plan in place and we can say all the right things, but if we don't do it, if we don't action it, and if we don't change the culture, then we will not be successful. We can hire somebody with a disability, but if we don't make the work environment um, welcoming, they're not gonna be successful. And they're not gonna wanna stay. Um, we can we can say all the right things, but if we're not living it through our actions and our and our interpersonal relationships at work, if people don't trust that that culture is there of inclusion, then people are not going to feel like they can disclose. Uh, people who acquire a disability while they're at work are not going to feel like there's an there's an openness uh, to to helping them adapt at work, and they're going to leave. So. Culture does uh, eat strategy uh, for breakfast, absolutely. And I think culture is the piece that is essential that we get right. It's also the hardest, right? Because building that culture means confronting all of our unconscious bias. It means for every one of us, uh, we hold these. That it is, it is just in our brains, right? We've, we've experienced things and it has colored how we view the world. And... We have to be able to, to do that work individually and as organizations to say, where are those biases? Where are those barriers? And how do we change it? How do we make this a culture of inclusion? How do we, how do we wake up every day um, and come to a place that, that we help to, uh, through our actions and our, our intent, make a place that uh, welcomes everyone? whether that be as employees or as customers or as recipients of service, 
how do we ensure that we have baked accessibility and inclusion into our our thinking every time we pick up the pen to start a new project? Are we asking the right questions from the beginning? It's not something that's going to happen overnight. It's going to happen because people take up the torch and they say, we can do this. Um, they ask questions. They're not afraid. They're not afraid to make some mistakes along the way. And people with disabilities have to be included in that process from the beginning so that everybody can learn that together and they and and that their expertise and their innovative thinking uh, skills can be brought to the table to challenge what will be some very difficult situations. You've had one year on the job and it sounds like it's been a busy year with a lot of things on the go. But if you had to reflect on one success story, what would that be? We're just getting started and we're just figuring out how to be most effective in this space, how to how to be most helpful. Um, but that said, I would say that the biggest success or learning um, in this first year has been that there is a readiness. There is an intent. Um, people are people are really eager to do the right thing. I think we've come to a tipping point in society overall where people say, well, of course we should do that. That's the right thing to do. Well, why wouldn't we do that? Of course, I, I, I want people with disabilities included. They just don't know how to do it. And, and, and so we're at that, we're at that tipping point in terms of we now have a law uh, that says we will do this. Um, and people are actively thinking about it. And I'm finding that the, the engagements that I'm having are really, really positive. People want, people want to get this right. Um, so the fact that there's that readiness and willingness to look at these issues and look at doing things differently is, is a real success. I mean, we haven't always been here. This is new. So um, I would say that has been uh, a real bright spot in, in the first year. There are lots of individual successes that I've observed inside different organizations, uh, whether they've had success with a hiring pilot, or um, or a, you know a success sort of re envisioning a building and and really building accessibility in from the start. There are those kind of individual successes out there, but uh, I would say the we're we're still at early days, and uh, the biggest success is knowing that people are are actively thinking about this work. That's that that is so important and the value of people being on site and being willing to work on accessibility and inclusion cannot be underestimated. Now, you did say it's early days. So uh, bearing in mind that there's obviously a definitive challenge around finding your feet and organizing your schedule and figuring out who to talk to. Was there nevertheless something in the role that took you by surprise, an unanticipated barrier that you didn't think you were going to encounter? Yeah, no, I, you know, I think. The unexpected, it's not an unexpected barrier. I think I, I think I, I came in with my eyes open. Um, my background allowed me to understand a lot of the complexities of, of working on systematic or system wide uh, changes um, on on these these really big intractable issues um, that we've had so little progress on for so long. I'm not I'm not surprised by it, but frustrated perhaps at times um, by the pace, the slow pace uh, of change, just like I think every person with a disability who wants this to just have been done already. Um, you know, I live this, I'm, I'm in the community. I, I have, I've been fighting these battles my whole adult life. Um, and, and so I'm as impatient as anyone else. And so that there is that frustration, I think that, that it takes so long. On the other hand, as a you know, from a career perspective, I am very aware and very pragmatic about the reality of the change takes time, um, and that these are not ships you can shift overnight. Uh, you, these are these are things that will take time and effort uh, and concerted effort. So, I would yeah, it's it's I think that 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 constant challenge that I will face in this role sort of as an internal struggle myself is is that pushing forward and being positive about the, the steps we're taking and the and the moves we are seeing versus my own personal um, 
views and feelings, which I think very much represent those of others in the disability community about, my gosh, it's not rocket science. Can we just get it done? <laughs> Right. Uh, you've mentioned the lived experience aspect of this job. How much, uh, how important has being a part of the disability community been in carrying out your role? Uh, I'm sure in instances where it's come to talking with members of the disability community, it's been very helpful to say, look, I can relate to what you're going through. But are there also instances where maybe it hasn't been as much of an asset? No, I think it's an asset. I think it's important. Um, I think it's really important uh, just from the fact that I deeply believe in my heart and in my soul that representation matters. Um, visible representation matters. People need, people with disabilities need to see um, that there are people with disabilities in leadership. And people inside systems need to see that representation and that leadership as well. And I think um, my, my own experiences as a person with disability who acquired a disability, um, and has been sort of a learner my whole adult life around the issues of disability broadly, um, you know, beyond those that I face into all of the, all of the different aspects, um, I think is helpful. Um, it certainly, I think it brings me an ability to to get fat get to the point faster um, with advocates around what their particular challenges or issues are it helps me to translate i think between um between sort of the public and the and the policy a bit um but i think it also allows me to reflect um and be patient um with those who don't, who don't live this, who are not in our community, who do not have the experience, um, and to give them some space to be wrong, um, and 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 help them to understand that that's okay, right? That that we're not angry that they didn't get it right um, the first time, or that they didn't know, because I think so many people feel apprehensive um, around engaging with people with disabilities or on this topic of inclusion and accessibility because they don't know if they're, if they're saying the right thing. They're afraid to do the wrong thing. And I look back to my experience as an individual. I have said the wrong thing. I have done the wrong thing. And I have frankly just forgotten things um, in, in, my, in my own world, right? I was preparing a PowerPoint presentation for, for something early in my tenure here and all of a sudden went, oh my gosh, is it accessible? Uh, it wasn't at that time. We we fixed it. But but I mean, it, even I, in this role, had missed it, right? And that's going to happen. And we have to give people that space. And I think, you know, when I was first injured, I would say, oh yeah, I can go to that place. I've been there before. It's accessible. And then I would get there and realize there were three or four stairs and there was no way I was getting my wheelchair up three or four stairs. And it, it dawned on me that I just didn't see it. I I didn't need it, therefore I didn't see it. it those barriers didn't exist to me. And it wasn't because I didn't care about other people, it's that I didn't need it. And so I didn't notice. And I think giving me or that experience from myself and recognizing that I myself have made those errors gives gives me an ability to give others some space and and opportunity to ask questions uh, and and learn because together um, this is it's going to take effort. Not all people with disabilities have all the same issues. Uh, we know very much the issues of disability and how it affects people are as diverse as people are. Um, so there's a lot of complexity here, and from time to time, things will actually compete uh, for for access. What you know, what's right for, or what would be perfect for me as a wheelchair user, might be very different than what would be perfect for someone who's blind. And we will have to find the best for for all, not perfect for anyone. Um, and that's uh, balancing those those priorities and, and challenges is. Is part of the job, but because of my, 
you know, 30 years working on these issues and working with people with such ro a wide variety of um, challenges, I think I have a, a really good perspective. Um, and certainly I know what I don't know, but I know where to get the information. Stephanie, I really appreciate that you spoke to us today and your insight and your compassion that you bring to the job is deeply appreciated. Thank you for, for being on the program and sharing some of your thoughts and good luck on the job. I'm sure you'll be great. And I look forward to having you back to check in on the second anniversary of your tenure as Chief Accessibility Officer. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. Stephanie Cadieu is Canada's Chief Accessibility Officer. Well, folks, we are right up against the clock. It's been great being with you today. If you have any feedback, you can write to feedback at ami.ca. Find us on Twitter at AMI-audio. Use the hashtag PulseAMI. Or you can give us a call at 1-866-509-4545. That's 1-866-509-4545. My videographer today has been Matthew McGurk. Marka Flawlo is technical producer. Ryan Delahanty is coordinator for podcasts at AMI-audio. And Andy Frank is manager at AMI-audio. I've been your host, Chuita Gupta. Thanks for listening. <laughs>